Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We are going to continue in our Got Wisdom series, and as such, today the topic in Proverbs is money management. Now, I know um, probably all of you are not happy to hear that title, Um, and I will say it may soften uh, your distaste for that by me saying that this is not a message about increasing or giving to the church. I, I know some people say the only time the church talks about money is when they need more of it. Um, this is not at all what we're talking about. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about how a Christian should manage their money um, beyond just a charitable contribution to the church. So what I do want to do is talk about a solution to financial problems. And now, without raising your hand, uh, how many people would say, hands not raised, that you have financial troubles? That you would say that, honestly, there is a problem with finances. And what we're going to talk about is a solution. Now, the solution may not be what you might expect, um, but it does work. Because that's what God tells us to do. So first off, let me just give you the easiest solution towards your financial problems right off the bat. Now, by that, I, I'm going to need a volunteer. And uh, the volunteer needs to have a little bit of trust and a denomination of U.S. currency of something. All right. Pastor Randall, come on up. Uh, You need to have a denomination of U.S. currency, a little bit of trust. What do you have? I got one. A one. Two. How about that one? (laughs) That's one of the new ones. $100 bill. No. I got a raise. A cure, for, a cure for financial difficulty. Here, you hold this. Figure out, you, make sure you can use it because it's a little tricky. There you go. Not a problem. And what we're going to demonstrate by this illustration is how you can help your financial situation. One Benjamin Franklin and just a little bit of, go ahead. (laughs) That's pretty. (laughs) Thank you, sir. You betcha. (laughs) Now, yes, I was not gonna burn U.S. currency. Well, technically, I don't know. Counselor, I know it's illegal to burn U.S. currency. Does that count? Because technically it didn't consume by fire the currency, but it was on fire. Not guilty. Okay, we're good. So here's the point. How does burning money help your financial situation? Well, first, it doesn't. I, I'm not suggesting that you burn money, but I did give you the illusion that I was going to burn money, and the person that had the money demonstrated a willingness to trust someone that may tell them to do something differently with their money than may they may have thought on their own, which is what I want to encourage you to do, to have a little bit of trust in what the Bible says about how you should do things differently with your money. Now, most people think that financial problems are based upon not enough money. So the solution would be more money. Now, the Bible says something differently, that the problem with most financial situations is not a lack of money, but a love of money. Let me say this again. The the financial problem that most people have is not a lack of money, but a love of money. In other words, 
your solution is not more money, but less want or desire. If we were to be honest with ourselves in a time of self-reflection, we could probably say without too much trouble that our financial situation would be better if we had a little less want. People sometimes think that their finances will be cured by throwing more money. But if a person is struggling with materialism, throwing money at it's not going to help. It's a little bit like an addiction. Let's say you have someone struggling with a substance they're addicted to. How many people would think that the best thing to do with a heroin addict is to fill their house with heroin? Now, that's kind of what people think. If, if, if my problem is with money, I should just fill my house with money and then all my problems are, are, are okay. You, do you know what often happens to someone that has a problem with materialism and then they get a lot of money? They spend it very quickly. And because of that, they, they carry emotional scars and some of them commit suicide. I mean, if you just look at some of the lottery winners, I know and some of you won't believe me, you're, you're still going to think that I would be better off if I won the lottery. I wouldn't take it if you gave it to me. I worked in a restaurant where they used to give out lottery tickets for successful days, and I just told them, hey, give me the money. Just instead of giving me a $10 lottery ticket, just give me $10. And over the course of working there for like three or four years, guess what? I was ahead than anyone else. But besides that, that's not the point. The point is people think, well, if I just got a lot of money, I would be better off. In all reality, what do you think would happen? Most people that win a lot of money spend it within less than five years. They get themselves in such a big debt that they buy million-dollar homes that they end up the bank takes from them. They have nothing to show for it except a lot of depression. So needless to say, let's say again we're talking about an addiction. The addiction in this case is materialism. It's unlike other addictions in the sense that the substance is necessary. For instance, money is necessary. The Bible never says money is evil. The Bible doesn't even say that money is the root of evil. Some people misquote the Bible and say that money is the root of all types of evil or all evil. The Bible actually says the love of money is the root of all types of evil. Money itself is morally neutral. Having more or less of it does, make you, does not make you better or worse in the sight of God. But that being said, how you manage that money is important to God. That being the case, if you have a lot of money or you have a little money, you would be better served by learning how to manage it, not necessarily having more of it, but learning to have, to have wisdom with it. That's what we're going to look at in Scripture. Last point when we're using this idea of addiction, you'll see in a, a video here. You know, in our society, this idea of materialism is one of the few addictions that are socially acceptable. Yes, it's, it's unique in that people think that having more of the substance they're addicted to will help them in their addiction of materialism. It's unique that you actually need the substance, you need money to get by, but it's also socially acceptable. A person that is greedy or desires material gain, in most cases, are, it's, it's socially acceptable. Hey, that's good. You should want to get ahead. But what does the Bible tell us? Take a look at this. Let's be honest, we live expecting to be happier and more fulfilled when we have money. Money buys us stuff, which gives us a thrill, and it pays for things like insurance and savings that make us feel more secure. But do money and stuff really make us happier? Even with the abundance of material goods we enjoy in our country, it's telling that one of the biggest American pastimes is shopping. 
We aren't satisfied because like an addiction, we'll always crave something new or different. And what about security? Does money really make us more secure? You don't have to look very far to see once powerful and oh so secure fortunes crumbled by economic or natural disasters. What truly fulfills us as human beings is to grow in knowledge and love of God and to be doers of his work in this world. To be adventurers, imaginers, builders, healers, bringers of justice. But if we want to be free and flourishing as God created us to be, we have to deal first with our dependence on money. If we don't learn to depend on God and to be generous to his work, we'll never move from bondage to freedom. We'll always be stuck living in tension, anxiety, and mediocrity because we do not fully trust God to provide for us if we were to step out. So ask yourself, are you willing to step out? Do you really believe that God will provide for you? Remember this, Jesus said, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So as we look at the book of Proverbs and talk about money management, I can say that not all financial troubles are specifically based, up, based upon moral failures, but the Bible does say a lot of times the problem is not lack of money, but really the love of money. So as we talk about management of money, we're going to see how that we might better suppress materialism instead of just trying to increase our monetary gain. So we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 22. And in Proverbs 22, there is a lot of wisdom about how to manage your money. We will be going through other Proverbs as well. So I, I hope you brought a copy of God's Word, and we will be moving back and forth through that. But Proverbs chapter 22 is where we're going to start. And as you are able, would you stand with me uh, for the respect of the reading of God's holy, written, inerrant Word? Look what it says, Proverbs 22. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Thorns, are, thorns and a snare are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave of the lender. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fail. And the rod of his fury will fail. Whoever has a bountiful eye or generous eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Would you pray with me? Father, I do thank you so much for the truth in your word that helps us to learn how to better manage the money which you have entrusted with. I pray that you just certainly give us wisdom as we come to a solution to some of the money problems we may be facing. This we ask in Christ's name. And God's people said, thank you. you may be seated. The main idea that I want you to see from this passage, first and foremost, across the top of your bulletin, you can write this down, but God is concerned with how I handle money. That's the main point I want you to get. As much as money is a morally neutral thing, the presence of money does not make one better or worse in the eyes of God. However, the way we handle that money God does care about. If we put ourselves in a very bad spot financially where we're surrounded by debt, that hampers our ability in our relationship with God. So he certainly concerns himself with how we handle money. And what we're going to look at are some biblical principles for that. Got to knock out one simple thing real quick. Uh, look at 22 verse 6. This 
passage, I think, is probably one of the ones, if not um, one of the top ten, that are quoted somewhat out of context. Uh, 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. First, it's interesting to me that that's within the context of financial stewardship. Um, Many people use this to say that if a parent does right by their child when their child is old, they will be right. And although the context is certainly talking about financial stewardship, that principle would still be applicable in this passage. However, one must consider the literary context of this book, the book being Proverbs. What does it mean to have a proverb? A proverb is not an absolute truth in a sense, but rather a general truth that applies. For instance, although these are inspired proverbs, we we still would want to handle them in the same way. For instance, a proverb that we use sometimes, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Now, generally, is that true that if you eat right, you will get sick less? So the proverb is true. Now, how many people have you ever had confronted with cancer and told them, hey, you know what, chemotherapy, it's it's overrated, just get some Golden Delicious. That's all you got to do. I mean, to the extreme that the, the principle is true, but it is not a bulletproof absolute truth. And I have to say that because a lot of times people will see that verse and either a parent that has a child that is not where they should be with God, they'll say, well, hey, that means it's my fault, not what this passage is saying. As a proverb, it's basically saying, if you want your child to be right, the best chance you have at impacting that child is to train them right. But it is not saying that every child that is trained absolutely right will always be absolutely right. Just setting that aside because I didn't want your minds to wander on that. That being said, we want to talk about financial principles, not just parental principles. That first would be in chapter 22 verse 1 it says a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold what's it teaching us there more important than money should be a reputation and God's blessing simply put I put it down this way point number one money should never become my first priority God is concerned with how I handle money because first, if I am mishandling money, the Bible has a name for that. If your first priority is money, you know what the Bible calls that? Idolatry. Yes, it is covetousness, a a desire to always have more, a desire that is not quelched by giving oneself more, but it's quotes by someone wanting less. But the idea that to always put money first, the Bible calls that idolatry. Hebrews 13 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So if we're talking about why God cares, God cares first because money should not be first in my life. How do I know if money's first in my life? Well, if you're willing to let me burn one of your Benjamins, that might be a good indication, but beyond that, what does it say in the text? You should choose rather a good name or you should choose good favor. I, I wrote it down this way under letter A. Money should not cause me to lose my integrity. How do you know if money is the highest priority? What are you willing to do to get it? If you are willing to do something outside of God's will in order to obtain money, that means money is a higher priority than following God's will. Everybody fairly okay with that? Uh, There was a book written the day America told the truth. 
In this book, it was asked several people what they would do conceivably. What would they do for $10 million? Here's some of the answers. 25% uh, of the people would ab abandon their entire family for $10 million. 23% would become prostitutes for at least a week. 16% would give up their American citizenship. Uh, another 16% would uh, divorce their spouse. 10% would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% would kill a stranger. 3% would put their kids up for adoption. Some of you on the last one, you say you probably do that for a lot less, but... <laughs> Beyond that, I mean the idea that someone would compromise themselves morally for multiple millions of dollars is kind of a concern. I mean, ultimately, if you were to say, okay, for a million dollars, I would kill someone. And then I say, well, would you do it for a hundred? You say, well, no, that's crazy. So well, we're just negotiating a price. You've already established that you're willing to compromise your integrity for money. Now we're just trying to find out how much of a compromise you're willing to make based upon how little money that I give you. If a person is a person of integrity, they would say, it doesn't matter how much money you give me, I'm not going to compromise my ethical principles or my moral standing. Now, uh, this was a, presented in a story from Theodore Roosevelt's biography. Theodore Roosevelt was a cattle rancher. And back then, the people that were responsible for the cattle were called cow punchers. Anybody ever heard that term? Yeah, they don't use that term as much because I guess it sounds violent towards animals. But uh, cowboys, you could call them, uh, cow punchers, were responsible for keeping the cattle. And in one particular instance... There was a maverick steer that had wandered away from the herd. And as it was, it was right on the property line between Theodore Roosevelt's property and his neighbor. Now, the specifics of the story went that this particular cow was on the neighbor's land. It was unbranded, so although it was outside of the herd, they couldn't tell who it belonged to. Based upon the law, it was on his neighbor's property, so who did it belong to? The neighbor. It was the neighbor's cow. Now, that being said, Theodore Roosevelt came up and saw a couple of his cow punchers or his uh, cowboys had started a fire and had one of his branding irons in the fire. He asked these cowboys what they were doing, and he said, we're getting ready to brand this steer, Mr. Roosevelt. And they said, well, I thought you said this was found on my neighbor's property. Yes, it was. That's okay. We'll take care of it. He said... Well, it belongs to him. You're heating up my brand. He said, yeah, that's okay. We'll take care of it. Theodore Roosevelt then responded, Sirs, I have mo no more need of your service. You're fired. To which they certainly exclaimed, What's the problem? He said, If you're willing to steal for me, you're willing to steal from me. If you don't have enough integrity to choose the difference between right and wrong when it's in my favor, you will probably choose the difference of wrong when it's in your favor as well. So simply put, God is concerned about how we handle money because if we're mishandling money and money becomes a higher priority than our own integrity, that's a problem not just for us, but it's also a problem for God. We carry the name Christ. If we as Christians behave in such a way that would cause us to do immoral things for money, what does that say about what's first in our lives? Ultimately, take a look at this. A couple of Proverbs, I think, that insulate or uh, reinforce this, pa uh, this principle. Take a look. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20, starting in verse 10, says, Unequal weights... And unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Uh, then down in verse 14, bad, bad, says the buyer, but when he goes away, then he boasts. Two ideas. First, 
if, if you were in a, a grocery uh, environment and instead of having weights that were accurate, for instance, if you were weighing out a pound of flour and the weight you used said a pound, but really it wasn't a full pound, the Bible says that's an abomination to God. You are choosing to cheat people for money. God doesn't like that. And then it says about someone that would purchase something. Ah, that's worthless. Worthless. Why would someone say that about something they're getting ready to buy? They try to get it for a cheaper price. And then when they go away, what do they do? They boast about it. So if we are motivated only, and it's not talking about that we are negotiating for a fair price, but it's talking about that we're intentionally trying to manipulate someone for the purpose of saving money. God doesn't like that. Uh, you can look Proverbs 16, giving the idea of doing what's right above even the monetary gain. Proverbs 16, 8 says it this way, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. How do you think our country would change if we held that as a standard? It's better to have just a little bit with integrity than a whole lot with willingness to do what is wrong. So I wrote this down as a, another principle. The first reason why God's concerned about our, our money is because God doesn't want us to lose our integrity. Secondly, I wrote this down, letter B. God will bless me when I overcome greed. The reason why we should manage our money, because there's a blessing that comes with correctly managing our money. God does not want us to be consumed with greed. He doesn't want our first priority to be money. He doesn't want us to be materialistic. He doesn't want us to be covetous. Take a look, Proverbs 28, 20. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Verse 25 of chapter 28. When the wicked rise, people hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. And you can still see in the, uh, the verse that we, the chapter we just left, Proverbs 22. It says in verse 4, the reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. It's interesting that when God tells us that if we manage money in a righteous way, that he will bless us with money. It's not a hard thing to, to, to realize. And as the video first was giving a question do we rather trust our own ability to maintain our financial health or do we trust principles from God and how he tells us to manage our money? Because ultimately that makes the question. Now, why is greed something a problem with God beyond just the obvious that if, if we are greedy, we'll probably do things that we shouldn't do? If we are focused solely on getting more and more, we're also not focusing on what we should do. Is that fair to say? If your first priority is getting more, only getting more, then instead of doing what you should do, you will be focusing on that. Take a look at this. It's all about a number. It always has been, even before I knew that it was. After doing 80 to 100 hour weeks on Wall Street as an analyst, I finally realized what I was chasing. A number. What my net worth had to be to give it all up. At first, my wife was resentful of my long hours and my distracted attention, but then the kids came and she was just as distracted and exhausted as I was. And the kids, I'd sacrifice when they were little so that they could have this amazing life and then they'd look back and see that all I was doing was out of love for them. But the grind, I was now sure never, I would finally catch that number, that thing I had been giving up my life for. That number would finally let me have long vacations with my wife. 
and get to know my kids on a real level, surrounded by my family's love and respect. I mean, who doesn't want that? To feel that their whole life had been validated. Now here I am, the final lap. I'll retire at the end of the year. I'm still young enough to really enjoy it too. One of the lucky ones to get out in time to really live. Jesus posed the question, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul? It puts us into perspective of what material things should mean to us compared to spiritual things. Again, we cannot love God and money because they are contrary to each other. So in proper management of our own money, we have to understand that we can't have money as a top priority because doing so would obviously put everything else that should be a higher priority, second place at least. There's another reason in the text why we need to manage our money according to godly principles. Take a look again in the text. It's somewhat implied, but I think you, you pick it up pretty quickly. It says, verse 2 of chapter 22, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Now, what's it saying? It's putting on a, a, a scale the rich, those who have a lot, and the poor. And what it's saying is God has made all of them. Why would he even have to tell us that? I think implied is the fact of human tendency. When we are around people that are rich, we treat those people differently than people who are poor. Is that a normal thing? In society, is it common for the average person to treat someone who has a lot of money differently than someone who has a little money? Okay, so I think that was what's implied, and the point number two I wrote down is this. Money should never change how I treat people. Why you should manage your money according to godly principles is because if you put money in the wrong place, it may impact how you treat people. And that can go in a couple different ways, but ultimately the idea is this. Take a look at Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19, starting in verse 4. Wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. False witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. All a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends Go far from him. So it's saying, naturally speaking, when people are acquainted with someone with a lot of money, they're nice to them. They want to be friends with them. Someone that doesn't have much money, the converse is true. Now, what this passage is saying in Proverbs 21 or 22 is saying that the rich and the poor meet together at the same place. The Lord is the maker of them all. What is it teaching us to do instead of treating people differently? It should encourage us. I wrote this down, letter A. Money should not cause me to forget equality. Having more or less money does not make you better or worse. The Bible says God has made the rich and the poor. 
Now, some people would misunderstand this passage and assume that God has given providentially distinctions of rich and poor. In other words, if you have a lot of money, that's God's will. If you have a little money, that's God's will. That's not what this passage is pointing to. It's not saying that God has designed you to be rich or God has designed you to be poor. Look what it says immediately following this. To escape the idea of fatalism, it says, verse 3, The prudent sees danger and he hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer from it. Saying, if you are wise and you see something bad that's about to happen, you don't go down that path. But if you're not wise, you do and you suffer from it. Uh, not even beyond that, it says in verse 4, the reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Thorns are and snares in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. The idea is certainly talking about that if we are created in the image of God, we are all equal. Not that some people are created for riches and some people are created for poverty. But that being said, does our society treat people with a lot of money differently than the people that have a little bit of money? Even in the Proverbs chapter 22, it says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. The idea is we will naturally treat people differently, whether it's because of the amount of money they have or even the amount of power that they may have. I remember the story of the governor of Massachusetts was running for a second term, and as it was, he threw a a fundraiser, or actually some of his constituents threw a fundraising dinner in his honor. And so they were trying to raise more money for this governor to be governor once again, and He was going through the line where the food was being served. As he went through the line, he approached a woman who was disseminating, handing out the the pieces of chicken and held out his plate. She put one little piece of chicken. He said, well, excuse me, ma'am. Could I have two, please? She looked at him and said, sorry, sir. I've been instructed to give one piece of chicken per person. He said, well, I'm I'm really hungry. It's been a a long week for me, and I could really eat two. I'm sorry, sir. One piece of chicken per person. Then came the question that everybody thinks will impact another person's behavior. Do you know who I am? She shook her head. said, I'm the one that this entire party is for. I'm the guy that has brought all this food to bear. She looks at him and says, well, do you know who I am? He says, no, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. (laughs) One piece per person. Now, ultimately, the idea that people think that because they have more they will be treated different. That's one aspect. The other aspect is the human tendency to treat people better who might benefit us and the people that might need something from us that we would certainly treat different even further. How do we prevent that from becoming a problem? How do we guard ourselves from treating people that have a lot differently than the people who may need a lot. Well, the Bible gives us a a principle. Uh, The principle, if you'll look in verse 9, whoever has a bountiful eye, a generous eye, will be blessed because he shares his bread with the poor. Principle I wrote down for letter B is, God blesses me, When I become generous, generosity is the place we want to err. Yes, there will be people that will have need. Instead of putting an iron curtain down and say, just because you have need, I have no no use of you. That's not what God encourages us to do. But he encourages us to share with people who have need and to be a generous person 
being generous is, is much different than a person who is just covetous or a person who is materialistic. Uh, rich people that are only concerned about riches probably don't share their wealth very well. They don't play nice with others. But what God is encouraging us to do is to treat people equally. Now that being said, does that mean we should give blindly without any consideration to whether there is an actual need or whether the, uh, the need might hurt the person by giving them money rather than helping them? Take a look. Proverbs chapter 3 is an interesting principle on the idea of generosity. Proverbs 3.27 couple principles to hold to it says do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it so a couple questions someone has a need first thing you ask yourself am I able to help when it is in your power to do so second question do they deserve it now, that's a difficult question because who are you to say whether they do or do not deserve it? Except to say, if someone has a problem with substance abuse, and it's a pretty reasonable thought that if you give them cash, they are going to take it and use it for that substance that they want to abuse, you giving them money, although that's what they ask for, is what we call enablement. You're helping them keep their problem. So I do think the Bible encourages us to be wise with our money, even in the aspect of generosity. But it's certainly not telling us to never give to someone who's poor. In fact, the Bible says we will be blessed by giving to those people who have need. Two concluding points, and we'll wrap this up. We're really talking about why God is concerned with how I handle money because money should never become a first priority. It will cause me to lose my integrity and money should never change how I treat people because money should not cause me to forget equality. Two concluding points that we'll talk about how. Uh, how should we learn to handle our money? Or better question might be, how do you get past materialism? If you would agree with me for a moment that some of the problem you have with money is not a problem with a lack of money, but the presence of materialism. If you would acknowledge for a moment that throwing more money at the problem really won't be the solution, but is really decreasing the desire. If a person has a desire for more, it doesn't matter how much they get, they will still want more. According to the American Dream, people were asked, how much money do you think you need in order to be content? You know what the average person said? The average person that made $50,000 said they needed 100000 The average person that made 100000 you'll never guess, they said they needed 200000 Basically, didn't matter about how much a person made, they always wanted about twice as much as what they made. And even if you made that amount, guess what? You would get into a point where you would still want more. The problem is not a lack of money for most people. The problem is the presence of materialism. So what do we do? First thing I wrote down was this. Under concluding points, we need to become good stewards of our possessions. What does it mean to be a steward? Yes, they're a person that manages something without possessing them. So if you owned a business, you might hire a manager. The manager is going to know that that's not their business, but they are responsible for it. A steward is the same thing. Stewardship is the recognition that what we have is not ours. Take a look at, at, at Psalms 24. Psalms 24 says it this way, The earth is the Lord's 
and the fullness therein. The world and those who dwell therein, for he is founded upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The Bible says, God owns the earth and everything in the earth. How many people are part of what's on the earth? How many people have something that came from the earth? So we're saying everything belongs to God. People don't like hearing that. I mean, I hear people sometimes say, Pastor, everything I have, I earned. I pulled myself up from my own bootstraps, and everything I have, I did from the sweat of my own brow. So where'd you get the boots? Who gave you the strength to sweat? I mean, really, what can we say that we have that we have not been given? Yes, you earned a lot, and that's great. But that does not diminish the fact that God owns all of it to start with. So if we understand God owns it all, it changes how we might deal with what we have. Instead of spending part of our money for things that we might maybe not need, if we become just a little better at managing our money, because really it belongs to God, that would change things. There's another principle I think that's good. So first, we need to become good stewards of our possessions. Another idea comes from this principle. I've heard people say, I didn't have shoes, so I got mad at God and shook my fist to the heavens until I looked down and saw a man that had no feet. The idea that Our status, situation in life, is of abject poverty, is a relative term. I mean, sure, it is true that there would be a a standard of financial uh, wellness by which you would qualify for government assistance or not qualify. But really, when we're talking about whether we're rich or whether we're poor is really subjective. And one thing that might help us is to learn to be grateful for the things that we do already have. I mean, have you ever, like, found a a piece of clothing that you forgot that you had? And it was almost like going shopping all over again. It's like, wow, I forgot I had this. Now, if you forgot that you had it and it's still in the bag with the original price tag on it, then there might be a problem. If you're, you're buying so much stuff, you forget that you even buy it and don't even use it. But beyond that, the idea that what we already have is a lot. Here's a couple suggestions I heard an author make. You can try them if you want. These are not my ideas, but I'll give them to you nonetheless. Take all the furniture out of your house except one table, two chairs, and a blanket for one week. See if that changes how much you value what you already have. Take all the clothing except for one pair of clothing and one pair of shoes out of your house for one week. Uh, Turn off the running water. Turn off the electricity. I know some of you might say, if I just turned off the television for one week, I'd probably die. But in all reality, if we reduce some of our modern conveniences for a week, that we might learn something. I've heard it said this way. Contentment makes poor men rich, where discontent makes rich men poor. The last thing I wrote down was this. We need to learn to be content with our possessions. If we would choose to rather decrease our desire instead of striving to increase our monetary wealth, if we would diminish our materialism instead of striving for money, things might change. If we took an honest look into where we're spending our money and say, hey, some of these things are probably in excess and learn to manage our money better, think of how life might be different. Let's pray about it. Father, we do recognize that you own everything, even the things that we might think are ours because you created everything. You own it. 
Lord, I just pray that we would each be able to look into our own lives and, and learn from the, the wisdom in the book of Proverbs that you are concerned with how we manage money. And if we have money at too high of a priority or if we're treating people differently because of how money impacts us, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to do better. And Lord, through this, that we would be better managers of the blessings that you've already given us. Father, this is our desire, and we ask it in Christ's name. God's people said,